Hello everyone and season's greetings again on December the 18th as we open the next window of the Two Fat Lardies Oddcast Christmas Advent Calendar for 2023. And behind today's window is the question, what are the good ways to end a war game which include creating a feeling of the players having achieved an objective but also deliver a plausible narrative for how things have evolved in the game and ideally also give an indication of what the implications of victory are for the winning side. Gosh, well there's quite a lot there in that window. I think over the years as I've staged and run participation games at various war game shows and also at games days is the importance of having clearly thought out and identified victory conditions. It's a game, so I think it's entirely fair for the players to expect to know how they can actually win a game. And not just in general sort of terms, you know, get to the other side of the table, take the objective of the hill or cross the river, but really carefully thought out and specific game objectives for each of the two or three or four different sides. I think writing those down and handing them to the players so that the players in a game can consult those over the course of the war game is a really good idea. I know Richard's view is to some extent mentioned in one of the previous podcasts uh, during the course of this year, not to tell players in participation games hardly anything at all. But I do think that a clear identification of what the victory conditions are for a game really helps. I've mentioned before the oddcast that I've always found the force morale table, which is used in so many of the two fat lardies uh, stable of rules, to be a real game changer. I remember playing in so many war games in the 80s and the 90s, which went on for hour after hour after hour, because there was no clear determination metric within the rules. And the force morale table does achieve that, but it's not the answer to everything. Using the force morale table and defeating an opponent by crushing them in morale is certainly a valid way of playing any game. Uh, and it does have historical precedence, but it also encourages or can encourage a slightly odd playing decision sometimes by the players really to try and destroy the final weapon team needed for victory as opposed to really focusing on what the historical combatants would have been thinking about which is perhaps more likely to be achieving or attempting to achieve a really critical objective in the game. So one of the questions which then arises is well what are those objectives? Do they simply have to be linear objectives or terrain objectives? Or can there be something which is created and crafted more for the different sides engaging in combat around the table? So those are really complicated questions. I also think that they're questions which are light years beyond many of the games I grew up with in the 1980s. Sometimes that seems like last week, uh, although it was really 40 years ago. But in that 40 years, there's been so many different gaming mechanisms which have been developed, so many innovative games. And I think this is one of those points that it's completely valid to look at other games, uh, war games, yes, but also role-playing games and board games to see how some of those different gaming mechanisms have made sure that the players around the table are able to identify and deliver a gaming conclusion which is both thematic and also satisfying in gaming terms. There's so many different examples I could have pointed to, but I've got just two in mind to mention in this advent window. The first one is a real favourite of mine. It's a game called Chaos in the Old World. It's set in the Warhammer universe and it's developed by Eric Lang. I think it's a brilliant game. It's got four factions in the original game. And each of those factions has a different way of winning. The game's quite unpredictable owing to player and also factional interaction around the table. And the different ways in which each of the player factions can win absorb the other players in keeping an aspect on every part of the game and every part of the gaming board. Perhaps we can take a leaf from that sort of game. Another example I was thinking of was relating to role-playing games, which are focused on different achievements in the game, not just tangible, monetary, linear or physical objectives on the tabletop. 
I'd mention in this regard a great role-playing game, Pendragon, uh, set in the world of King Arthur and the Round Table, designed by Greg Stafford and now reimagined by David Larkins, where the th objective of the game is gaining glory. It's not on money, it's not on titles or castles. So those, those contribute towards glory, but glory is the heart of the game. Maybe that's also something and a different focus which we can take back to our war games rules. So we're building a picture of different victory conditions, different objectives which go towards ending the game. Things which are not just physical achievement points or just collapsing the force morale of the other competence on the table itself. Once we start thinking of a wider context for gaming mechanisms which can lead to one side winning, we're able to think about adding victory conditions which augment and complement traditional ways of winning war games. So of course we keep those traditional themes of strategic, operational or tactical objectives on the war games table. Take and hold the hill, defend the castle, cut the railway line. But it's also a mindset and a, an approach which allows us to create victory conditions around other objectives which might include cultural or societal victory conditions. So what do I mean by that? Well, I think it's reasonable for victory conditions for one or both sides to not just be focused on physical or geographical objectives or even force morale. It's also fair and reasonable for one or both of the sides to have victory conditions which are embedded within the key societal metrics of their particular time. So the attainment of honour is a really obvious one in that regard. In my current focus of wargaming, which is medieval and early modern Japan, especially as focused and reframed in the art and folklore of the late 19th century, the attainment of honour is a paramount objective which combatants can focus on realistically on the tabletop. It was something that contemporaries in the medieval early modern period thought was important. It was certainly something which was focused on in the late 19th century and when art was being considered in respect of those earlier periods. But honour isn't the only type of societal objective. There are others. Panache, fashion, style. All of that's relevant to the attainment of legendary status as an engine in victory in a game as obsessed with social status as 17th century France, at least as imagined in the books by Alexandre Dumas. I could easily see a player on one side losing a physical objective in a game, but doing so heroically, honourably, all while displaying considerable dramatic panache. That display may by itself count as a victory. The fact that the musketeers might have been kicked out of Paris by the Cardinal's Guard may not be the key aspect in the musketeers' victory conditions. The fact that they've been kicked out of Paris while escorting the Queen of France over to meet the Duke of Buckingham may be a victory objective for the musketeers, just a different one as compared to their opponents in the Cardinal's Guard, for example. So we can have a number of different ways of ending a game. Games can, of course, still end by reference to their traditional measures, but there can be different ways of achieving a victory or ending the game, which are more focused potentially on a narrative environment. Another way of potentially doing this is creating physical objectives, which can be taken by the players around the table. So these are different to the geographical objectives, the hill, the castle, the railway line, which we mentioned before. I played a really interesting game uh, with a friend a couple of weeks ago where the objective was seeking and discovering clues which allowed, a, allowed an access point to different levels of the game. So I'm guessing that the inspiration for that might have been video games. Um, but in this particular game, the objective was the clues which allowed access to a sequence campaign. The objective wasn't necessarily to fight in the first place. It was to really gather the clues, remain undetective. And of course, in gathering those clues, there was a risk of combat. But it was another really smart way of creating victory conditions which were unusual, but still brought a conclusion to the game, which was very narrative in scope uh, and not just dependent on a fight over a particular part of the table. So hopefully placing all these different elements together 
allow us to keep the traditional objectives of a miniature war game on the table, complemented by a force morale table, but also responsive by reference to other imaginative ways of winning a particular war game. It doesn't mean losing the primacy, for example, of a geographical objective, but it does mean potentially augmenting that with other things that the combatants historically would have preserved in their own minds as being an important element of final victory. <laughs>